Hi, Yan. Hi. Hi, Banu. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, fine. Thank you. Lovely to get connected with you. Yeah, it seems good. Like yeah, it really feels good and motivated. Absolutely. No, no, it's really good. How, how are you all over there? Yeah, we're all fine having a lot of audits happening. Good. Uh, most of it uh, online. So we do the stakeholder consultation, most of it online. And then we have a couple of meetings with the uh, client to freeze on the uh, vision, vision, and objective activity scope, and just brief meetings in and out. But most of the uh, processes are now virtual, even the stakeholder consultations. Do you think that will continue like that? I think for the next six months, we can expect the same situation yeah. in India. So we still have the third phase fear on, and uh, we have the lockdown till 31st of this month. So we don't have the churches and temples open and public gatherings again restricted. Right. Um, the offices can function and colleges limited 50% uh, uh, of the attendance like that. They're given an option for the colleges to function, universities. Schools, of course, uh, online classes are on. How are things in the UK? Um, it's 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 really weird because it sort of feels like that um, it's still happening and it's going on, um, but it's not high profile or important to the government anymore. Um, okay. And I think, and it feels like um, there's still a huge amount of disruption because a, a, a lot of young people are suffering. Um, so you know so 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 colleagues of mine who have families young children you know they're picking it up they're sharing it and it's going around but um but but people <laughs> older people like me you know have had vaccinations and my children are older so um you, you know but I, I don't know the, the the infection rate is still very high mm. So yeah, it's very, it's very strange. The uh, sad part is many are not getting vaccinated for the fear of the uh, effects of the vaccine having a greater impact on the COVID itself. So that is also there in our country. That's a very, yes, I think there's a bit of that here too. There are people who, who, who don't want to be vaccinated or yes. think it's unsafe or, you know, they might have cultural or other reasons yes. um, so no it, it, it is difficult um, and I suppose there is always that worry that I mean it's difficult isn't it it's based on a flu vaccine that has been used for years so it shouldn't be that risky but um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very rare cases and that is the sensation in the media you know how they blow it out of proportion so yeah the remotest of people are not aware of the advantages of having a vaccine and severity going down because of that so a lot of awareness the government is also making it mandatory now to fly within india or abroad to have that vaccine card with you so yeah i think only the legal process will get things better so um so hello collect Hi. um we are expecting a few more, probably at least 10 more people. Uh, there's a few people coming um, just now. So Lata also will be joining a bit later. She's in another audit meeting. So she'll okay. be coming to our phone, I think. So she'll, she'll be joining by the time we have a session on. OK. So, so maybe we'll give her a couple more minutes and hope no that um, I mean, I have had a couple of apologies this morning, but only two. So there should be probably another 10 people. Um, so not now that you're, sure. I presume you're recording the session, so you can share it with those. Yes, I am recording. Yeah. yeah. Um, few people coming there. Yeah. So, so Banu, are you OK to speak first? In you know, starting in a few, say at five past eleven. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can make me a co-host because I have got a PowerPoint and a we'll do. document to share. So that. Uh,
Okay. Have you got that now, Bannon? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Does anybody else need to be a co-host? Hi, Tracy. Dave's brought his band with him. <laughs> oh dear. Okay. okay, shall we go for two more minutes? Yeah. Morning, everybody. Morning. How many were signed in, huh? There, there were, there were, there were sixteen, and I've had two apologies this morning. And we've got one, two, three, four. So we've got nine. So there's a few people. I know uh, Lata's coming, isn't she, Banner? Um, okay, one more minute then. Go on. <laughs> I'm just researching something for my presentation. Somebody sent me some really helpful links this morning, so I'm just putting them into the presentation. Yeah, one more. Okay. Um, Shall we start then? Mm. Okay, yeah. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the Social Audit Network virtual roadshow talking about um, using the <coughs> United Nations Sustainable Development Goals in social accounting. Um, welcoming uh, Banu from San India, who's going to talk about some of the work that they've got. Uh, happening over there using the sustainable development goals. I think um, from what she's been telling us, they're, they're quite a, well advanced in using them in their social accounting. And then I've just got a few slides with um, some thoughts to provoke some discussion. And then we're hoping that uh, we get through all the slides in about 20 minutes between us. And then with that leaves us uh, a good half an hour for a discussion uh, around this topic and in particular you know how it might be useful to use the sustainable development goals uh, going forward um, where to start perhaps um, and any other sort of top tips and thoughts that people on the call have this morning so can I hand over to Banu uh, uh, You're on mute. I'm muted too early, sorry. Anu. <laughs> okay, thank you, Anne. Lovely to be part of the San UK uh, Member Forum and uh, thank you for the opportunity. I would like to discuss uh, the topic on using SDGs in social accounting. I hope my screen is visible. Yes, so Lata will be joining me anytime now. So without much ado, I'll start the session. Uh, so we talk about uh, social accounting and audit framework and SDGs, we see a lot of similarities. Yeah, we are, of course, thorough with our uh, SAA manual and uh, what we are uh, reporting on. Uh, and we know the framework is enabling organizations to build on existing documents, yeah, which we have the reports uh, or the reporting systems, which is evolved for the organization. And the, the uh, team is to prove and to improve. Yeah, that is the uh, USB of uh, SAN framework. Uh, so when we talk of the SDGs, on the other hand, SDGs, we're talking about a global framework for organizations. Yeah, and again, the key focus is to see that the organizations, communities, and countries are able to measure and report on the triple bottom line, that is the social, economic, and environmental aspects, uh, both uh, from international recognized series of metrics as also within there, own indicators of uh, 
uh, they have national level indicators in India. So in that matter also, we have your own indicator sets. It gives us a good uh, leeway to report on the UN uh, SDGs. So there are the detailed indicators, uh, sub-targets specified for each of the SDGs, and it's a very good uh, learning uh, experience also when we went through those uh, metrics. So when we talk of the similarities of SAA and SDG, I think we should take pride in saying that we are, we are the predecessors of SDGs, much thought about ahead before the UN SDGs came into play and before it was made. Uh, it says, uh, CSR in India uh, is also uh, encouraging corporates to report on the SDGs. But I think uh, Social Audit Network UK was a predecessor in saying that, yes, we are reporting on the triple bottom line and most of the indicators are aligning with the SDGs, which has now been evolved. The difference I would say is for us, we are uh, having a framework which will enable organizations to build on existing documents and reporting systems, whereas the SDGs is giving a global framework for organizations, communities, as well as countries to measure their uh, social, economic, and environmental impacts. So uh, we say the triple bottom line, the social, economic, and uh, environmental uh, verticals. So we have got, again, in the SDGs, three pillars, uh, economic, environmental, and social pillar, in which we can classify all these 17 in that respect to verticals. So uh, again, uh, why we need uh, this particular reporting of SDGs? or the social accounting in order for that matter. The advantage is that we do both qualitative and quantitative analysis. Yeah, so with the uh, indicators uh, defined by the SDGs, whether it's global or national level, we have got a valid input which we can key in and come out with a, a qualified uh, analysis for the review. And it is a tool to just uh, not only to monitor, but also to see how we can have the future progress uh, with regard to people, plant and prosperity uh, in line. So it is an effective mechanism for us to track the program which we are engaging with. Uh, so it is a universal call of action, these SDGs, I would say, so that we uh, focus on ending poverty, protecting the planet, and ensure by 2030, that is the uh, timeline which we have given for uh, SDGs, to see that all people have a peace and prosperous planet to live in. Um, so uh, SAA, as I said, is specific to organizations, and it is not made mandatory. But these uh, SDGs are now being encouraged uh, by organizations to see that they are aligning with the global index. So how do we integrate the SDGs in our social accounting accounts? What we do in uh, San India, when we do the social accounts uh, for an organization, we have a new section called SDG alignment. I'll show you some examples and where we can put it in the annex so that people can also see how the program is aligning with the uh, sustainable development uh, goal agenda. And when we report, uh, on these SDGs, we can also see the advantage the organizations have towards contributing to the global uh, uh, goals. Yeah, and say that not only aligning to the organization's vision and mission and the national level interest of how we have prioritized our programs, but also see how we align with the global index and uh, see uh, whether we could have that measurable or have it at least in our plan to see for the future outcomes. Uh, so when we have this organization local goals be in sync with the global goals, the perspective totally changes. So any organization which is engaging in a program will see at the larger agenda and see how as a nation we could build up our program to achieve these SDGs. So uh, as auditors uh, for uh, SAN, uh, we encourage our clients to plan activities in such a way that they could align with these SDGs. Or if not, they have only a few or uh, uh, no SDG alignment uh, for the program, which I don't think is possible because all the verticals are already covered in the uh, CSR Act Schedule 7 in India or the SDGs for that matter. But we can always come back with a recommendation saying that we can work towards a global goal. So it's also a feel good factor that beyond the state, beyond the uh, nation, we are looking at a, a global agenda to see how our nation can uh, move forward. So, uh, as I said, I have got a few reports of uh, San India, which we had documented uh, and had these SDG alignment done for uh, leading organizations in India. I will zoom this.
is uh, is it visible? Yeah. Yes, we can. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. So when we say CSR agenda, corporate social responsibility agenda in our country, it's getting very strong now for uh, corporates to report on uh, the work they do, the impact uh, they have created. And as I mentioned in the last session, if I'm right, the uh, new amendment in the CSR Act in India defines any corporate spending more than five the budget to engage in a third party assessment. So uh, we use the SAM framework to derive the social impact assessment report. So, but for the panel and uh, uh, what do I say, uh, mentoring of a social auditor, that process, everything else happens uh, in the way we report uh, as, as per the SAM framework. Only thing is we have tweaked a few uh, uh, parameters like uh, reporting on relevance, effectiveness, efficiency, sustainability factors. So based on the client's need, we report, but then we do have a section on uh, SDG alignment. So this is an example for a corporate which we did. It's called Pine Tree Foundation. And uh, the program was focusing on disability, women and children, education, health and hygiene. So uh, we have got several tools you know, uh, to tell us which SDG has got uh, alignment with which program. And now I would like to uh, announce rather at uh, this forum that uh, San India is now uh, working towards developing a tool either as a mobile app or a matrix a sort of a template where we could have this SDG alignment easily tracked. So it could be serving as an SDG tracker. So you put your programs, the indicators and all that, and it automatically tell you which SDG it is aligned with. Remember when matrix I shared a long time ago, I think two sessions ago, like that, we're trying to come out with an app. So it is simpler for anyone to understand and see which of the SDGs the program is aligning with. So when we talk about this particular program, which we are engaged, uh, I think uh, two years ago for Mindfree Foundation, and as I told you, the key focus area were defined, uh, you can see that uh, most of the programs align with SDG 1, no poverty. So any input you give, you have to see whether you're aligning with uh, starting from 1 to 17, which of these programs. So when we have this livelihood opportunities provided for uh, a prison program uh, in Karnataka, or a life school program or a scholarship program, if we can always indicate that it leads to no poverty. You know, by having education, you can uh, earn your own income or creating library opportunities. You've got more income into the household where they can have enough food for the family. So we can align it to SDG 1, which is no poverty. Uh, there was also another program where they had uh, these disabled uh, people uh, being provided mobility aids, physiotherapy support, yeah, early identification. Uh, so awareness programs are created around that. So medical support and screening and community-based reappearance centers all that we could align with SDG 3, which is good health and well-being. Uh, likewise, when they had education program providing infrastructure for the tribal children or mainstreaming them in the schools, yeah, uh, creating a skilled workforce for the youth and women. So we brought all that aligned with SDG 4, which was for quality education to add on the tuition centers, of course, which they did. Uh, SDG 5 was on gender equality. So they had a program as exclusively for the girl children and also for the women. Uh, in the uh, semi-urban areas, uh, providing them more opportunities for sustainable livelihoods. So we could uh, align that with SDG 5, which is gender equality. Uh, they had a program, which is interesting, they're focusing on use of menstrual pads. So we aligned it with the sanitation program, which comes under SDG 6, clean water and sanitation. Uh, like that, we can go on and on. They had employment opportunities for women, for rural, uh, to start up small rural enterprises and placing the disabled youth in the organized sector. So we aligned with the decent work and economic growth. When they focus on tribal women and children who never had access to quality health care earlier, we thought it syncs with the agenda of 10, uh, SDG 10 talking of reduced inequalities, where we had migrant children or the most marginalized sections not having access to education earlier. And now with the intervention of the organization, they're having equal opportunities. And all the CSR activities of Mindfree Foundation was work was done in coordination with partner non-government organizations. So of course, SDG 17 was uh, seeing that it was aligning with that agenda as well. So it is a very uh, simple exercise. We don't do it at the start, of course. So after we work with the program, get into the more details, uh, you know the nativities and seeing the uh, uh, outcomes are being mapped in our uh, map impact map framework, then we can easily list the SDGs the program is aligning. I'll give you one more example. This is a large project of Larsen Intuitive Technology Solutions. This again had wide, uh, uh, what it is like, 
from watershed management, which is the most uh, the funding pumping into, to the livelihood support for self help groups focusing on women entrepreneurs again here and healthcare and school infrastructure. Some programs are also focused on solar electrification in rural villages. So, what SDGs do you think align with these? Uh, of course, uh, I'm not go by the key focus area. Uh, what was a uh, <clears throat> the order, but I will go as per SDG. So when I told you any program on livelihood support, you are uh, providing a better education leading to employment, will of course define us saying that we are moving out from poverty. So there's scope for more, more uh, uh, employment opportunities, yeah? providing more income generation programs so uh, the household has enough money and they can move out of this poverty zone. Uh, they also had a program where they had cattle and cow being provided as alternate employment. Uh, so when they have provided uh, uh, um, the cattle uh, for the family, they could have milk, they had milk animals, so they can have more money uh, or revenue from the milk they sold. So again, adding on to the household income. So sustainable agriculture production was one uh, program in the watershed. So the water table goes up. Again, they can have sustainable agriculture production. Uh, so leading to nutritious food, sufficient food, so linked to zero hunger. Uh, Good health and well being when they had eye care programs, pre cataract uh, surgeries being done, cancer awareness, and in fact, uh, a program on maternal health, reduction in low birth babies, we aligned it with good health and well being. Uh, the quality education was uh, because they had uh, trained uh, community uh, animators, you know, they have in the villages where we have local uh, youth being trained on how uh, uh, they can. Uh, They say, uh, uh, do the uh, basic paramedic sort of a support for the communities living in the area. So they train these ASHA workers, they say, uh, which has been provided uh, with government support in the local communities and in mission care centers being started. Um, gender equality, uh, because they focus on specific, on empowering women to take leadership roles. Uh, they had this uh, RO plants and water uh, res uh, water. Uh, RO plants where they have the bubble top waters, no? uh, where they could refill and sell it at a, a cost. So they have got uh, women self-help groups or Mahila Pani Samhitis, they call in Hindi, being formed in the uh, region. So uh, these women were empowered to take up this leadership role so uh, they can have more monies coming into their self-help groups where they could have more women accessing this grid. So we aligned with gender equality. So this particular program has got 17 such programs aligning with. Yeah, so water and sanitation, with so solar programs, aligning with affordable and uh, clean energy. And when they had more of employment opportunities that was aligned with decent work and economic growth. And when the water harvesting infrastructure, like check dams, trenches, the watership program was done, we aligned it with the uh, SDG 9, which talks of innovation infrastructure. Though not much of innovation, but at least with the infrastructure, we could align with. The small and medium enterprises, for small uh, landlords or small holder farmers was actually an advantage in this uh, remote areas in Maharashtra where we had tribal women having access to healthcare. Yeah, uh, and also the tribal population now have uh, clean energy, solar energy uh, fitted uh, uh, panels uh, to recharge the mobile so they have access to uh, lights uh, in the evening times. So uh, all these inputs have, uh, mitigated the uh, migration pattern from the rural areas to the urban areas and the watershed program having more income from the farmlands coming in. We say that yes, SDG 11, uh, they have sustainable cities and communities. So farmers are happy to live in their village and not migrate anywhere else. So the next generation probably for education reasons, they would have migrated. The farmers most of them prefer to continue living in their own villages. So again, we're we are avoiding the wastage of rainwater with all the trenches and the a ponds are deepening and uh, check dams and all being done there. So the responsible consumption and production was one of the global agenda they adhered to. So again, with the watershed and uh, rainfall uh, management uh, uh, systems, uh, rejuvenating the environment, we were addressing the climate action. Yeah, And uh, by desilting the ponds, like with the water, we also could uh, see that the cattle and uh, uh, like how the cattle was benefited uh, from the uh, uh, life on land, like below water also was taken care of because they had fresh water and there was no pollution here. So uh, this was uh, peace justice institutions because they were part of uh, community ownership for the solar project and the watershed project. So inclusive decision making was uh, part of the agenda here and all of them 
we're partnering with local NGOs for implementation. Uh, so a project may be large, it may be small, it could be just one off program, it could be a hospital, one more example, we don't have time for that. Just a hospital providing healthcare, but still you can align it to seven or eight SDGs that providing healthcare, how you can link it up to better uh, income levels or uh, lack of uh, uh, unemployment rate. Yeah, uh, because of the health reasons, they can continue working in the job and have more number of working hours being clocked uh, and more income adding thereafter. So uh, this, uh, I will not say it's very simple. You have to understand the nuances, get through the thorough reading of SDGs and indicators. And if you have any national level indicators, get thorough on that. And then once you have impact map ready and the outcomes again chopped after your uh, first level of discussion with the a client is done, you can easily arrive at the SDG matter for the organization. So I think I'll stop here. Lata has joined. Lata, you want to add anything to this? Thank you, Pam. Lata. Yeah, she's a, I think she's connected over phone. Oh. Yeah, she's, she's hi. Here. Hi. Hi, Lata. Hi, hi. Nice to talk to you after a long time. Good morning to all of you. Good, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Yeah. Good. yeah. yeah. So as uh, Banu was telling, everybody is excited that you have included the SDG component into the social accounts now because they feel uh, they are also doing something to not only to the uh, to the local communities where they serve, but also they are contributing to the the sustainable development goals, which makes a uh, makes them feel very good about it. So we are also happy to just introduce one section within the report, and it also helps us in the recommendation section. Also, it for us it gives a clarity as what they could do to make them align with more other goals, and we can give it in the recommendation section. No, that's that's really helpful. Thank you. So, is that in the um, is it in the compliance section of the report that you are using the SDGs, or in the in the main body text of the report? Yeah, in the main annexure. body, in the social impact, or as a annexure, we do it. Okay. So that's brilliant. Thank you. Has anybody got any questions now for Banu or Lata or? Can I just whiz through a few slides myself? Um, any questions quickly? Priya. Hi, uh, morning Hi. and afternoon. Uh, morning. My question around aligning uh, an activity or a project, project can be big, it may have multiple components. Sometimes I struggle whether it should be like, is there a mandate which says you align it to only one SDG? For example, something on education can be fighting poverty and also education, right? So mm -hmm. is it okay to do that or do we need to? Yeah. In fact, the advantage is to have alignment to more than one SDG because you can always link to the uh, no poverty means again, having a health program because you know hunger and having nutritious food. So. Uh, you can see how, it, but you should have indicators to say that, measurable indicators to say that this is the reason why you're aligning to the SDG, but not making a long list saying that we're having all these uh, as your to be able to justify the reason why you're aligning. So in that uh, chart I showed you for each organization, each activity, I'm narrating why I'm saying SDG one or two or three. So that that will come out. So these corporates would like to flash it on their website saying they're aligning to the global agenda, and they also need reason to say that why they're doing it. Yeah, because all the SDGs are interlinked. So you can't say that it's only aligning to one goal. So that we keep telling everybody that even if you're working with health, automatically you're also working towards the other goals. So you don't have to only necessarily say it's one goal. There are direct goals for, uh, there are direct activities for one goal and there could be some indirect activities for the other goals also. That's helpful. So, yes, Dave. so there is no pressure on any company like you know you are you are better because you are doing aligning to say 10 out of 17 whereas even if you do one that is equally good right yeah, yeah. that There's is no what we tell as them. Of now. Mm. but they are all happy uh, if they say so next time when i do the audit i should see to it that i'm there in all the 17 is what they they put goals for themselves 
So there has been a, a few organizations which over a period of two, three years have started reporting on all the 17. So it makes them do little more constructive and focused work. My, my contribution was going to be, um, I guess my support, what, what you know, the discussion we just had, is that you, you can be more granular than just the 17 um, goals because there's uh, 169 targets. Yes. Yeah. So underneath each goal, there's a number of targets, which, mm. which is if, if you, and then you can probably see that the work that you're doing fits better with, with some of those and will contribute to one of the 17 goals. Yes. It's like no poverty is like, you know, um, whereas there's, you know, there's, there's about seven or eight different, different targets there, mm. which mm. then become sort of can link with the reality of the projects and the outcomes that you're looking for yourself within your own project and your own yeah. organization. So I think that's, that's um, probably quite a, you know, quite, quite a, a useful thing to, to look through. So when you're mapping your activity ag against um, the SDGs, actually it's, it's probably important to link it to the target that's there. And then from that, there's an indicator which then you can use. So it's, it then becomes much more practical, I think, in, in the way you apply it. It's an exercise which you can do it with your team. Yes. When you're doing a project evaluation and that matrix I shared last time uh, along with Lata, we had showed on Excel where we've got these indicators linked with each of the SDGs and how you could chalk them as, you know, as a mapping tool and be easier for you to come out with which SDGs are aligning to which of the projects you are working with. So it's an exercise which you can do with your uh, team uh, along with the client whom you're auditing. And it's simpler for you to get this list. I think the so one big problem which we have faced is most of them do not work towards those environmental goals. So the our green office checklist is a real eye opener for them. They say, oh, we don't work on any environmental issues because obviously the environmental goals in that are little, uh, you know, it's on a deeper level. So then we say, okay, don't feel bad about it. Just do the green office checklist for now. Yeah, sure. And next year, yeah. So that's what we feel though, as though the social accounting is a, it's just a step towards that. No, so it, it becomes easy for them to also uh, start working on some environmental initiatives. And then they'll say, okay, I'll work towards that. But basic things like, you know, we have this rainwater harvesting, every building has to do it. So we'll say you are working towards, uh, uh, life underwater and things like that, though you do not know about it, but there are some small activities which make you also uh, con you're, where you're contributing towards that goal. So it's, it's very interesting, you know, that they, they all want to now work towards the goal. I think it's a very positive outcome, as you as you say, within a team having that discussion, because you, you it open, opens up that whole new world of and widening your horizons in terms of what what with your organization what you're actually contributing to that it's got a yeah a bigger picture than just the very focused um thing that you're doing perhaps in your own neighborhood or or whatever so um bayou has put a question in the chat yes saying regards, uh Balu, do you want yes. to which sure. It is in the implementation by a corporate they report it in a sustainability report both separately or combined in annual report against the prerogative of the corporate, how they want to report on it. Uh, annual report, yes, uh, in fact, SAN India or CSIM for that matter, we have the SDG alignment as part of our annual report and we are put up in our uh, website. So uh, like Lata said, we can either put it in the main report or as an annexure, but as long as they report, they're happy about it. It's possible to apply this social accounting in CSR report, yes. Uh, yeah. There are many organizations which want it in the dashboard in their CSR page saying that, oh, we contribute to, they just put those icons of the goals and they say we contribute to 10 goals and 18 goals. So after the report comes, they're able to put it in their dashboard. So they're all quite happy to, you know, have this also part of the report and it adds value to them in that way. As of now, nobody is into really measuring that is there because it's only now they're all into the alignment stage. So we keep telling them at least for one or two years, you try to get into the alignment stage after which we could probably do a lot of measurement, which you want by giving numbers and all that. And most of the measurement is, uh, you know, for the environmental goals, only you need to measure all those. A lot of things need to be measured, not the others. 
which is quite simple because uh, we do in our uh, uh, social audit report itself most of it comes like most of the measurements are there but only in case of the environment goes a lot of uh, measurement and them making them uh, collect data is becoming mandatory for all those greenhouse gases and all that which they'll have to report on saying that this much has been saved by us and all that so otherwise the other two pillar, pillars is very easy the social pillar and the environment uh, the economic pillar is more similar to all the things which we do in our report it's only the environment pillar which we also need to really you know think of how to help them to measure such things okay are there any other questions just now keep thinking um i've got a few slides which um which just um, sorry, trying to present it. There we go. Okay. So, and hopefully I'm not duplicate. I'm not going to duplicate some of the things that Anna and Lasse were saying. So again, you know, there's a link through to the goals and the and the targets um, and the indicators. So. Um, and I was just doing a little bit of research on this, and there's quite a lot online about using the SDGs in impact reporting. I think more corporately than maybe for smaller um, voluntary community NGOs, etc. Um, but here's some figures from uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers. So it does look like certainly in, in the corporate sector, SDGs are being used quite widely in impact reporting. Yes. So, um, and, and maybe these are some of the reasons why. So um, certainly a move towards standardization and sort of organizations using similar impact frameworks um, so that, you know, uh, they're using them and thinking about what they're doing, how they can measure it. So um, a push towards using the SDGs as something that, um, had international meaning, global meaning. Um, also, um, I think the profile of the SDGs, uh, certainly in this country, is increasing. Um, and, and that means that, you know, um, people are interested in working for businesses that have um, a, a, an, an SDG, uh, a social, environmental, and economic com uh, conscience. And, uh, and there's it, it's how far does this get into marketing of organizations and businesses? But then I think the final point is the important one that, you know, how can we do this in a way that means that social impact has become a centerpiece of business strategy? Um, and, that, and there's some, some videos here on um, and links to things that you can look at to sort of think about how different businesses are doing that. Um, Lisa uh, sent me a link to this. So there's an organization in Liverpool um, who are looking at um, open source data platform around um, the SDGs. And there's an event there on the 21st of October, which you might want to join um, to find out more about this um, sustainable development goals data platform. Um, I'm not clear, Lisa, is this only for Liverpool or is it a wider thing? I think the platform has been um, established or set up as a Liverpool citywide um, uh, initiative, but um, I'm sure you know the organisation itself is very much um, outward looking. <laughs> so you know, I, th I think there's opportunity there for for information to be shared. But the collection, um, my understanding is that it's to be focused on the Liverpool city region. Brilliant, thank you. In a way, a banner that sounds similar to what you're talking about is using apps to collect data um, within an organization and then between organizations. So absolutely, it feels like there's quite a bit of work going on in that space. Um, some of the um, other examples, I think, um, I know Dave has spoken previously about work happening um, in the faith sector, particularly Church of England has been doing a lot of work around um, what we call real world impact, which picks up on the um, 
SDGs, also CAFOD as well. Um, there's something here um, called Impact Thesaurus, which has been launched by the Church of England. So again, looking at different ways and reporting frameworks in different sectors now, and certainly the faith sector is leading in the UK on that. I've also put a link to um, uh, Sam's partners with W Plus, which is Vera, and they actually publish a template for SDG reporting. Um, and that is used for collection of data on the ground and for um, their, their outreach and audit um, with projects across, um, across the world. I've also, um, I'm aware, so apologies, SVI is Social Value International, and they are developing and delivering training on uh, SDG impact standards for enterprises. There's the link through there to find out more. And the International B Corporation has um, just published a new tool called SDG Action, again, to encourage uh, B Corps to collect data and report against the SDG. Um, and then there's, there's another video there uh, to look at, which is about um, um, how businesses are using um, SDGs in their impact reporting. So I guess my questions are, you know, where do we start with this? Can you use the SDGs as a framework to sort of think about what you do? Um, you know, that sort of mapping, very simple mapping that uh, Banu uh, and Lata were talking about. I wonder if, you know, we, you can go as far as using the measures and indicators that sit behind them. I know some of them might be a little bit too ambitious, certainly initially, because I think they're supposed to be for uh, global or country reporting. So, you know, things like, uh, you know, uh, United Kingdom's reporting in against certain indicators, but some of them might be population level rather than uh, useful in social accounting. Um, maybe selecting the most relevant SDGs, um, I think, Anu is saying, you know, some of the organizations are just reporting against a small number of them. Could you use the, could you cross-reference your social accounting to the SDGs? I, I think I like that one because it does feel, as you said, that one project might be delivering against several of the SDGs. So is it more of a case of write your social account and then talk about the impact, but then actually benchmark against the relevant SDGs to the work that you're doing. So, so it comes that way rather than starting with the SDGs. Or could you use it to um, build some form of impact map? So a bit like, sorry, a bit like this, you know, what are we doing? What are the activities around um, the first SDG? And what sort of measures might we be using to measure them? That takes it a little bit beyond that initial alignment but actually thinking into what are the, um, the impact map that you're using in your social accounting. I'm going to stop there um, and sort of throw it open to discussion. Dave's put another link into the, um, into the chat for people. If I just explain that, if you, if, you if you find that page and scroll down, it's got each, each of the um, 17 goals. But if you go to the more information um, and click on that, then it breaks it down into the individual targets. So there's, if you just scroll it down, so it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it, it, that's quite a good, um, a good one to look at. Targets and there's a, there's a, um, there's a menu there. It says overview and then targets and indicators. Then it's got all the indicators. Um, uh, all the targets and then the indicators on a drop down menu. Uh, and and yeah. yes, we will share presentation. So, sorry, last slide. Yeah, so I was just uh, your slide, the last slide which you put up, Annie, uh, which says, Where do you start? <laughs> I think we start from the bottom, which you mentioned. We start with the impact map as usual. And uh, instead of in our impact map, instead of we putting an SDG for every SDG and impact map is not what we do. So when we do the impact map for every activity, we add one more column called the SDG. So there's impact, the output outcome, 
you can have impact and then you have SDG. So at that point only you can relevantly put no, because if you're doing something with regard to livelihood, you know, obviously you're working towards creating, uh, you're working towards uh, zero poverty, you're working towards better workforce. There are two, three indicators. So you have to add one more column in the impact map, which is SDGs. So it becomes very easy for us also when we write about the alignment, we can just pick up, okay, all this five came from these activities and it becomes easy to report. So that is the way we start. We start with the usual impact map and then we try to bring in the alignment because when we do that, it also gives us a lot of indicators. You know that there is a reference bank there of SDG indicators and we can tell them, yes, this is indicator is there and this could be your output or outcome also. So it becomes very easy as a reference point to do. Instead of us doing an uh, impact map for every SDG, I would only suggest that in your impact map, add another column SDG. It becomes very easy to do it. The mapping becomes excellent, very simple. If you're, I think if you're a social purpose organization, everything you do, there will be a, um, an SDG to link it to. Yeah. It's quite, it's quite comprehensive in you know, what it covers. So it's... So when we were doing the, uh, we, we did a course in social intrapreneurship where we had a lot of uh, corporates who enrolled in the course. And the main focus of that course was on talking about shared value. And they understood the concept shared value, but then once we did the SDGs, it really made them understand more. Like, you know, it really gave them an avenue to say, yes, we are doing all this. And, you know, they brought out the shared value very well by understanding the SDGs and reporting and saying that, yes, if we could report on the SDG alignment, that itself tells us what we are doing for both the environment, for the community, for the people, the planet, everything was, uh, they, it could, uh, they could understand it so well, you know, so we also, we never realized that this would be the high point for them. We were shocked when they said that was a real eye-opener for us. The SDG session was the eye-opener, was what came out from the entrepreneurship program. And then they all went back to their corporates and they started, uh, you know, working on it and understanding how they're contributing to it and reading the the material which we gave and the indicators. Th there should be some homework that these people should do. And there's so much of information in the internet on this. And some lovely videos are there, you know, which, which really explains each goal very well and it's very nice. There's a lot of research that's happened before they came out with this. We should really appreciate that. Mm. And we have another person, one social entrepreneur uh, whom we are associated with. He's coming out with an SDG tracker. He's saying SDGs is something which households should have. If every household, if every family can track in what way they are working towards every SDG. It was amazing the way he has envisioned it. He says, I'm going to give them a calendar with all the SDGs and every day or every week, they just sit back and say in what ways they've contributed to each goal, the entire family. Then the family is going to become a socially conscious family and you know, the world is going to be better. That was amazing. He was talking about this and we are going to sit with him and evolve a calendar which could be a SDG tracker and, you know, given to all families. The children should be trained on it. Every activity is related somehow, no? So how did you contribute to the world? What did you do for the water? What did you do for the land? Anything, any SDG, some activity, you can bring it. So this was another amazing thing which happened last month and we were all saying, okay, we should do something about this and come out with some nice uh, calendar or something with a call, the SDG tracker and give it to all the children. <laughs> Can I uh, ask ask a question, please? Um, in India, do you, um, have you changed the audit, um, the questions or the framework you use in audit to include SDGs? Or is it just the report that uh, talks about the SDG alignment? No, no, we are only using this as an annexure. So we have not changed the, the reporting format of the social accounting remains the same. We follow the same things, but this we bring in as an annexure. It also helps us to give the recommendations and all that. No, So we use it as a tool to uh, write the report in a much better way. 
So it's just enabled us to write more effective reports. For instance, we are doing an audit of a college now. So that they want us to also know, in, are we in line with the SDGs? So everybody is now, because that's a buzzword, they said, okay, tell us which are the SDGs we are working with. So we're just going to give them a one pager on saying, yes, you're working in all these SDGs also. We don't do any specific SDG reporting per se. We have, because for that, you need to do a lot of measurements. That reporting is, I think, totally different. We've still not uh, got into that. But we only use this as a tool to help in talking about their impact in a much effective way. And they feel happy that they are contributing to the, the global goals also. Do you, um, what, what do you think, uh, anybody here, where do you think this will almost like go next? Do you think this is going to be expected in reporting moving forward? Um, can I come in there? Um, and I think just to pick up on, I noticed that Priya had a, a message uh, in the chat, um, a comment in the um in the chat, and I think these are related. And I do think the SDG um, are much more commonly understood, and the language is being used much more than it has been. So in the UK, um, and I'm seeing um, certainly working with younger people and with graduates, there's an expectation, um, and they will choose where to work. They will make their decisions um, informed by these kind of more social, environmental, you know, ethical decision making, and we see it, you know, as as buyers, as employees. Uh, um, so I think increasingly, uh, it is it is becoming almost expected, and which perhaps and then that feeds into your direct question. You know, are we seeing more of it? And I think we have to see more of it if we're going to stay relevant and to keep relevant. Um, and I think it's. It's, it's, it's a little bit frustrating for those of us perhaps who've been working in the social economy for a while and understand that these things have been there and have identified the commonalities. But now I think there really is a, an opportunity for, for much greater alignment. Um, and I really uh, find it very, very helpful, you know, from Bani's presentation and your feedback, Lata, to see how how practical it can be and how easy to start that conversation and to move things forward um and have already you know made lists for myself to think how i could interpret this and integrate it into a couple of different scenarios social reporting but also thinking about small business planning and decision making um and i think it's more relevant and i think there's a, there's a hunger or an appetite for it as well yeah. Priya, yes. did you want to respond? It was your question. <laughs> yeah. I think Colette, I think she had her hand raised before me and Dave. Go ahead, Colette. Okay. Um, yeah, firstly, I'll just agree with everything Lisa said. Um, but yeah, the, the reason I joined um, this session was because it's something that I have been hearing more and more about over the last couple of years. And it's on my to-do list to look at it and, and to maybe start using it. And I just haven't so far, you know, made the time to do that. And so this was the start of that for me, really. Um, but yeah, definitely hearing more about it in, in the UK. And I think also, certainly, so I'm from the housing sector, um, a growing area for us is ESG reporting. And if we're going to be going out looking for financial investment, um how that market is changing and how that audience is expecting more and i think i, I just wrote a note down to, to have a look at that and it's something that struck me um during barry's presentation that i thought actually that could be an audience that is going to really um increase demand on, on linking our reporting sustainable development goals so um yeah i, de I definitely think it, it's an it's an area we need to know more about and need to start using Um, who was was it Priya or Dave next? Dave. Dave. I I put in the the chat earlier about a, an organisation called Pros Prospera, 
which uh, I had contact with recently, where they, they did a presentation as part of a, a webinar um, that they, they've, uh, it's fairly new, it's an entrepreneurial sort of uh, approach, but it's, they, uh, they work with companies, so in the corporate sector, like Anne was saying, um, in terms of their corporate social responsibility and what they offer as a service to help the corporates to map um, their corporate social responsibility against the um, SDGs. Um, and then to look at how they can measure um, the impact of what they're doing. So there, it's a, it's, um, it's quite a fresh approach. And I thought it was, there's a lot of alignment with what we're doing. Um, and I think it, it, it's, it's really helpful. I, um, just on another tack, I, I, I'm doing my community development work uh, linked with a, a local Sainsbury's that's being built. And they, they wanted their management team to come and do some work in, in a project that I was doing. Um, and, it, and it just struck me how, how, how are they measuring the impact of what they're doing? Because, it, and, and that's all about, you know, the, the, the reasons corporates get involved is because it's good for customers. It's good for employees. There's a lot of evidence that employees choose the company they work for based on the contribution they make to the, the, the community. And it's like everybody wins. And obviously, um, if, if they're going to help a um, social purpose organization, the organization um, has a, a big win as well. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's just great, I think, how the, this, the SDGs become a common language. Where it, it, and, and, and it's because it's so, as I said before, it's all embracing. Um, it's a common language. And, and, then, and then you can, that, that's really helpful when you're trying to create dialogue and, and collaboration, et cetera, to bring the corporates in on that basis, to, you know, to, to bring funders in. You know, it's, it, we're all talking the same thing and, and contributing to the same. So it's, I just think that's really, um, I think it's great to see. And I think it, for me, it's opened up a new window of work and that whole new window of understanding. Um, my my, my uh, experience so far has been slightly mixed uh, because I am based here, but as you know, I come from India. I still do a lot of work with the CSR fraternity in India and also the third sector. And I am also deeply engaged with various third sector organizations in the UK. And I see there is an increasing enthusiasm as Marie and Lata have shared in India to willingly adopt SDG and many common people, especially the NGO sector, quite immersed in this language of SDG. In the UK, um, actually, um, I have uh, had an experience where people have been working for various you know, biodiversity projects, environmental projects, and a lot of local causes, and, but they don't feel there is any need to align to SDG. What does SDG mean? Like not even aware of the terminology. And I appreciate them because what they are doing is already creating a lot of impact. So my, their thinking is, why should I align? I mean, what does this mean to us? So I liked it because there's no need because they are creating a value without having, um, so I don't know, that's why my uptake. And there is also a lot of cynicism with adopting SDG by commoners. I'm not talking about people like you and me who are into CSR, social impacts and social value. There's like, who has given these terms and why should we adopt? You know, uh, what does these, I mean, is this all politics? I mean, I had no answers because my work increasingly is to, I'm trying to see how to create. So I'm in the social value sector. I'm trying to associate people to as SDG so that they see the bigger picture. But I do face the cynicism saying who has created because there is a clearly dysfunction in the society, isn't it? Between the language that's being spoken by leaders who give these terms and what is being demonstrated across countries. So I feel, if I connect with them easily, when I say homelessness, they understand. But if I say such big jargons of SDG, uh, it just disassociates because they feel these are all given by some you know, very powerful people. We are out of reach. So I don't know. I became a bit confused uh, in between as, as, as uh, old as last week. Say, am I going in the right direction? Should I align these people to SDGs or should I hold back? Because... If I say litter picking, they understand. If I say, you know, beach cleaning, but if I say, you know, life underwater or big, it just disassociates saying it. So I was a bit confused, like, 
Mm, where is the trend? And uh, sorry, but I wanted to just uh, you know discuss this with you today. Look at the targets. Yes. Let them respond to that. Then, then, then you can make it relevant to what they're doing. Mm. It really breaks it down when you take poverty and break it down into seven or eight different targets. Then, then it then it relates the titles there relate to activity that you're doing, and then you see that it contributes to the whole thing of re, of no poverty, which is huge, isn't that? I mean, that's just. <laughs> <laughs> and then it feels so idealistic, Dave, that yeah. people feel that why should we use all these things? You know, this is disassociating us from. Yeah. So let us talk about what we can do and be happy with it. Yeah. So there is a bit of um, <laughs> disconnect that way. I put, a, I, put a, I put another link in, which is to a YouTube video that that, that explains um, in very simple terms. Uh, it's, a, it's a lovely little video. And they, they use a thing called um, the, the, the wedding cake, different tiers of, uh, of importance with the social, economic and environmental um, categorization of things. So that, that might be a useful resource um, to, to start people off. Brilliant, thanks Dave. Andy? Oh uh, yeah, I just want to say thanks for just, my mind has got blown this morning and it's almost a direct answer to what you're questioning Priya. Um, I'm coming at this and I've, I've come today because I've moved hats since I was involved with Sam before when I was with Tradecraft. Now I'm with Jubilee Plus, which is it working on the, the impact of social action projects, at least in a box at the moment with the UK. And what this has opened up for me this morning is almost a direct point, say, if we are truly global citizens, if we truly then have a common language that fits into an SDG, there is a danger without that, that just as we see in the UK press, we sort of debates around the 0.7%, the no, it's 0.5%, no, you've miscounted and misaccounted it. It's, an, it's a, something that happens here in the UK and then something happens in overseas development. For me, this is a cultural point about creating a language that says that everybody is a global citizen, that everybody gets a recognition of the fact that environmental issues, homelessness, lack of education, we see that even in an, you know, a, an economy that wouldn't see itself as a developing economy like the UK. We have massive injustice. We have massive sectors of society that are excluded and need to be aligned with sustainable development. And if we get citizens, corporates, policymakers, grant making bodies, and it's no longer about international development versus domestic development, it's about development. And for me, this, this actually builds a framework of a language that we can all start to speak which starts to build activism, which will help fund, you know, individual commitment to both international development or domestic development where there's injustice. So I th that's a light bulb which has come on for me this morning. I didn't see before this webinar. So that's just proof. Mm. Thank you. And if, if Priya, you've got a concern, this is all about politics. I think it's the other way around. I think it's about democratizing the concepts yes. in a way that everyday language can begin to say, which breaks down barriers between us here and them somewhere else who are having poverty issues. No, we're all global citizens. It's a good way of putting it. And I think that's a perfect way to end. And thank you so much for um, what's been a really useful hour. Um, I will send round uh, the slides that we've used um, and also a copy of the chat mm. with the links in. Um, to everybody who's been here today. If you um, do have any further thoughts, then, um, then please email back to the Social Audit Network. Um, but that's been brilliant. Thank you so much for coming along this morning, this afternoon. Sorry. Thank <laughs> you so much for inviting thank us. Thank you. Look thank forward you. For sessions. See you too. Yeah. Thanks, Amrila. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. It's okay. You're on mute. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was really, really very nice, actually. You know, um, I think having small groups like that works very nicely. How often do we get the opportunity to have a conversation like that and to have 
that different impact. And I think everyone was engaged, weren't they? Even the ones that weren't talking, had their cameras off, they were listening and they were putting comments in. And then, you know, like Andy came in at the end, there was like, wow. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah very nice, very good. And it, yeah, it's made me think, oh, well, we need to have this in our PIA of an SDG. Well, our, yeah, no, I think, I think as a very minimum, maybe, I was just thinking as a very minimum, maybe we, we reissue the impact map of say done. So I could look at the impact wall. Some of it, one of us could look at the impact map maybe. Mm-hmm. I think that for me, it fits in the compliance stuff, doesn't it? You do what you do, but actually how does that align? And I think that's mm-hmm. the light bulb moment once you then checked what you do in with the SDGs. It's almost like, and then you can improve. Yeah, and it's like then, an SDG lens. Yeah. So, yeah. so you do your social accounts, you look at the alignment with the SDGs, and then that goes into your business planning, doesn't it? It's almost yeah. like it's a filter for how can we do more. Yeah. So maybe, um, I don't know, but yeah, I think it would be good, wouldn't it, to just take some of this present the presentations from here and just put it as just a short section in the PIA. Yeah. I, don't, I think we should, I think, I think people will like it. You know, it's there's so much... It is, I think, pretty as spot on about the language. Yeah. You know, but, um, and actually it was Andy. Do you know Andy? Biggs, have you I've, I've met, met him? him a couple of, I yeah. think he's been to some fan events before. Like I say, when he worked for Tradecraft, I think he actually spoke at one of our, it might have been the Liverpool one that you missed. Oh, he's right. Me. Yeah. He's yeah. been involved in a workshop because um, Dave knows them, I think, and I've met them a few times. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think very, very interesting. It's good to have those wider conversations, and and really nice to make the connections with Fan India. Very yeah. as well. Yeah. The other the other thing that's flagged up for me, and I'm taking this back to my day job, is that there's a real risk that yet again the social economy hangs behind because businesses are actually getting ahead with this they've really you know the the sort of corporate sector has really grasped the SDGs and uh, you know are taking taking it into that sort of business planning and marketing and recruitment type area that you were talking about there's a risk that our colleagues in the social economy just go well we've been doing it for years so we don't need to yeah we take it for granted yeah yeah. And, and and that worries me but anyway that's just another conversation yeah. right I will uh, send around the slides later on um, yeah and I also because I've been away but I'll do a note coming back with this is what I think the new date that we're setting look like for events and things like this you know like a schedule of events okay. so we, you know just so we can see what's happening and when um, and then just double check in with yourself and Karen and Liz and things, you know, and, and oh, sorry, no, it was with Colette and Karen, wasn't it? You know, when um, do you want me to set up um, what, what day and what time do you want me to set up meetings and things like yeah. that? Anyway. Yeah, and I think that would be more relevant. And, you know, I I suggested that the W plus one, I, I even think I see it slipping again. You know, so I would, in terms of our actual activity, um, so I think that's something that could be pushed forward. So if we have theirs and a PIA before the end of the year, I think that's loads. So the so the one on so we have the envir- the environmental one rerun, yeah, but with input from W plus if possible. I don't know whether we'll be able to. I know, I, and I don't know how relevant it is or how much value it would add at this point. No, 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 I think that's fine. I think mm. if, we, if we run that one again, um, yeah, and do the PIA, that's probably enough, isn't it? Yeah, that's plenty, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, also, I also do think from some of the feedback that well-being would be a good... Well-being feels like... I was reading something that's come out from government on levelling up and of, of you know, of, of the, uh, the, the non let's build lots of things bit, you know, people's well-being feels like the thing that 
will come into focus again. Yeah. And it fits very neatly with it as an SDG. Yeah. So, yeah, it all comes together. Okay. All right. That was, yeah, good. I'm glad, I'm glad I was able to join you. Thanks Thank again you. for doing that. Thanks so much, Lisa. All right. See you soon. Take see care. You. Bye. Bye.